All right, turn to your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. The Bible says the last part of Revelation 22 and verse 18, Revelation 22, 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now notice the serious crime to God is when you dabble with his book. So God doesn't want you to add to his Bible. Don't add words to the Bible. Don't subtract words from the Bible. Uh, nowadays we got like a gazillion different modern Bible versions, right? So with this gazillion different modern Bible versions, someone is committing a crime right here. So God basically curses people if they mess with his book. Amen. He does not want that, period. He specifically puts a curse. So then think about it. If a person uh, honors God's words and they don't mess with his book and then uh, they revere it, then if the nation gets blessed and becomes more prosperous, then we have to ask ourselves this. Then maybe, maybe the book that they're using, the Bible they're using, is the right version. And we should keep leaving it alone. So think about it. In America and in England, if the Bible they had is not the pure words of God, it's been subtracted and added to, then why, would, uh, why is there no curse upon that? Why instead it seemed like as if they became more prosperous, more blessed. But isn't it strange once modern Bible versions came to the scenes, starting in the mid-1800s with the Revised Version, why did things suddenly start to go downhill? Wow. World War I came out, World War II, Amer America and England just fell apart. You thought about that? So think of these things in mind as we go through our history lesson as we go through our history lesson. There's no doubt that we see God's blessing, but also His curse. And then the warning that people fail to abide by. Okay, now, this is a chart that I would strongly recommend that you take a picture of after this. Now, you know me, I never ask you to take a picture of my drawings because I do not think highly of myself because I'm a very humble pastor. <laughs> so then... Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> going, going back, so, going back... Going back to the main point, I would highly recommend this because I occasionally turn to that page. Now, if you want a picture of this, Dr. Uckman uh, has it in his church history book on page 82. Church History, Volume 2, Peter Ruckman, uh, page 82. He did, uh, and when we're going through the timeline, remember I mentioned seven Great Awakenings? So it's drawn out in the map right here. Now, you'll notice from this direction of the revival how the Lord moves. Did you notice something right here? It's east to west. Now, if you're a Bible believer, you've learned this. But east to west means that's the good direction that the Holy Spirit moves. Now, I'm not saying every single time, okay? I'm not saying every single time. But you'll notice right here when you go east to west, that's the tendency of where the Holy Spirit moves. And then west to east, you'll notice a lot of times the evil spirit moves. That's the wrong direction. Notice how the movement of the Holy Spirit is going east to west, right? So then think about it. The, uh, the beginning of everything pretty much started out in uh, Jer Christianity uh, went to Jerusalem, right? It started there. And then it's going more west, right? Then it went to Germany, Reformation. Yeah. Or we can go to Italy with um, Vaudois, second century, early Baptist, ancient Baptist, we can call them. And then we go further uh, east, uh, excuse me, further west, you know, we're going east to west, right? Then it goes toward Germany, Reformation. Then it goes more England, King James Bible. Then America, Great Awakening. And notice right here, it's like this. Now, I kind of find it strange. We're like really the end right here at San Francisco, right? Yeah. Makes you wonder maybe what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. 
It's like, we're like at the end of the bay right here. The Holy Spirit's like, I'm just about done. But anyway, that's just my, I, I, it's, not, it's not what I believe. I'm not saying that, you know. Uh, but I just, you know, food for thought for our church, okay? For our church, all right? For only our people. Something to think about. Okay, but anyway, this, this is very pivotal. You're going to notice that in your history. Because as the Holy Spirit goes east to west, each direction becomes spiritually cold. Okay? That's so important to understand. Jonathan Edwards is the first. That's what started out everything, right? Jonathan Edwards started it right here in the New England area. And then George Whitfield and John Wesley really spread it all out. That's the first Great Awakening. The second Great Awakening is around the New York area. So from Maine and then uh, we get to the New Hampshire, Massachusetts region, but then we're hitting more, as we're going lower and lower, the second Great Awakening is the Cumberland Valley Revival, you might recall. So James McGrady is probably one of the forefronts, but then Charles Finney really spread it out, if you might recall. Charles Finney, he was pivotal. Then the third uh, came out, and this is toward, like, uh, we're hitting toward the southern region from North Carolina and onward to like Georgia. If you recall, Whitfield said that was spiritually cold during the first time. But then Schubel Stearns, he, uh, his legacy, what he left out, remember, was like uh, over a hundred Baptist churches. He only had 19 people in his church because he spread them out. So as time passed by in this cold area, it became the more, most spiritual area during the Third Great Awakening. Now we're right here, the fourth, the southern area. During the south, that's when civil war broke out. Now you might recall that's the area the Catholic Church infiltrated. You ever wondered why? The reason why the Catholic Church infiltrated right here is because this had the richest Christian heritage compared to the north. As a matter of fact, the north was criticized as being the secular part. And then the Southerners, they prided themselves as ones that were more biblically centered. Now, like I told you, uh, during the Civil War, you can, find, uh, you can find people who still had a godly heritage in both North and South. However, overall, what you're going to find out, you can see secular humanism, government, federal government, thanks to Lincoln, that was being more established in the North. So it was spiritually weaker, okay? It still had a spiritual strong heritage, but it was spiritually weaker. So it was more known and more prone to be more secular. The South was more known to be more biblical. It was known to be more spiritual. So that's the reason why the Catholic Church infiltrated that. And I don't have to explain or prove to you that has been thoroughly explained uh, last, uh, last discipleship lesson. But we're coming to the fourth great awakening and I'm going to establish uh, some articles here that prove that the South had more of that uh, spiritual influence. So that's why Dr. Ruckman in his church history book puts the Fourth Great Awakening right here. The reason why is this is because uh, when war breaks out, it motivates people more. So uh, I do not agree with what the, I'm not saying I agree with what the Southerners did about combining you know, their spiritual beliefs uh, with their war tactics or with war. So I'm not saying I agree with them on that one. But what I do like and what I do have to admit is that uh, whatever the people did during the early days of America, including the Revolutionary War, they always thought about God. All right. That's the bottom line. Whether they were doing war, whether they were doing their chores or in their work, their jobs, they always put God they always put a spiritual principle. So that one I can give them credence for. Even though I, don't, uh, even though, uh, I say I don't agree with them with how they combined or put religion uh, with, their, uh, with their warmongering or whatever you want to call it. Okay, But the bottom line is war motivated them more, obviously. So there was like an awakening, so to speak, toward more spiritual principles, biblical principles. And this is very, very pr much proven because the Catholics during that time when they infiltrated, uh, bishops, were, uh, uh, bishops were preaching their spiritual Catholic awakening to the Southerners there. 
The reason why the bishops were doing that in their pulpits, the Catholic bishops, is because the southern preachers were doing that in their pulpits. So when people came to church, even though they were thinking about the war, the, the spiritual conviction was even stronger that time. The spiritual conviction was even stronger that time. I'm not saying I agree with them. I'm just simply stating the, what the facts are. The facts are is that the people became more spiritually uh, convicted, more spiritually attentive during war. A lot of times when people are in a pickle or when they're fighting something or struggling, you tend to be more uh, bold. You tend to be more convicted in your cause, right? You tend to do that. So the article right here is Religion in the Civil War, the Southern Perspective, and this is from Harry S. Trout. He's actually... Uh, from Yale Divinity School. He mentioned uh, several things right here about the Southerners in their spiritual conviction about the Civil War and how the Northerners were compared to being as more secular. Right here it says, in their own constitution they wrote that actually, the Southerners. They actually wrote that in their own constitution. So it showed the people that time, there was no doubt, they were very spiritually more convicted that time, more spiritually pushed compared to the other states back over here. The new Confederate Constitution adopted on February 8, 1861 and ratified on March 11, 1861, officially declared its Christian identity Quote, invoking the favor and guidance of Almighty God. End of quote. Southern leaders chose as their national motto, Dio vin, uh, Vindice, if I'm uh, pronouncing that right. I'm assuming that's Latin. Meaning that God will avenge. Even uh, Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, he mentioned, quote, to recognize our dependence upon God and supplicate the merciful protection. Unfortunately, as you know, he's been influenced by Catholics, right? So the Catholics infiltrated that. But the bottom line is they were more spiritually prone. This national acknowledgement of religious dependence, see that? Religious dependence. As the South frequently pointed out during the war in both the religious and the secular press, stood in stark contrast to the godless government of the North, that ignored God in its constitution and put secular concerns above the sacred duties of Christian service and the divine commission. Can you believe that? <laughs> How about that? So there's no doubt the North, they were, a little bit, they were spiritually weaker and the South was spiritually more focused. This language of Christian na nationhood dissolved the barrier between religious and secular speech in the South and set the stage for a moral battle that declared a decline spirituality in the North, a region, according to the Southern vo voices, now run by infidels and fanatics under a godless government. They mentioned right here, here, so this is what preachers were preaching, obviously, during their time about the Civil War. Here's one quote from one preacher. God has given uh, us of the South today a fresh and golden opportunity. And so a most solemn command to realize that form of government in which the just constitutional rights of each and all are guaranteed to each and all. He has placed us in the front rank of the most marked epochs of the world history. He has placed in our hands a commission which we can faithfully execute only by holy individual self-consecration to all of God's plan. End of quote. So anyways, the point is right here that uh, they were more spiritually centered. As a matter of fact, right here we got uh, with husbands, sons, and fathers off at war, women filled the pews. And in turn, the preachers filled the women's hearts and minds with a new sense of their place in both politics and public action. It would be the women they understood who would be keeping the godly covenant with their morality, prayers, and home front support of the war. So notice right here that there was obviously a spiritual awakening in the South. Because why? Obviously because 
they felt like their rights were being violated. Because remember, the point of the South that time was our own rights of a state. We don't want the federal government to own everything. Remember, that was the problem with Lincoln that I heavily critiqued upon, all right? Lincoln, he had some good sides from Chinickley's perspective that I, uh, that I admitted that I gave the benefit of the doubt toward. I'm not sure myself, but I gave the benefit of the doubt toward. But the point is, is that he still made a mistake with that federal thing because that opened the door toward more federal practices. Remember, the Baptist distinctive and mindset is always independent. Remember the Revolutionary War, why that began. They, uh, they put their Christian perspectives into the war, you might recall, because they were thinking, we want our constitutional rights. We want independence and freedom. So remember that. So that's what the Southerns have. Now, uh, remember is that I don't condone everything that the Southerners do. I'm not sure if, you know, whether they were right, how much right or how much wrong they were in this one, because I label them the same thing with the American revolutionaries, okay? So every argument that I gave about that one or my opinions, you can watch that video and then you'll see my opinions on that one. I do know 1000% you can't use that today, okay? And I successfully argued that one last time, okay? All right, uh, anyways. So now, uh, oh, one more article that I should read. So another example is how the Southerners, when they were winning the war through one general, he was known uh, as Stonewall Jackson. If you read his life, it is actually very, very incredible. This man, everything before everything he, do, uh, he does something, he always prays. He always prays. As a matter of fact, he also... Uh, had a heart uh, for the uh, black slaves there and opened up a school and helped them out. Even the liberal critics, if they're going to find something against General Jackson, they cannot deny that he opened up some kind of program or uh, his family was involved in some kind of providing opportunities for black slaves. Even the liberals who really pound on Robert E. Lee that he didn't really flee, free all the slaves and all that kind of stuff. The point is, is that they still can't deny Robert E. Lee that uh, his wife and his family and even in his role, his part in providing some kind of opportunities for black slaves or benefits. So you cannot go around that. Even with the heavy liberal uh, media and material that tries to override the real Christian history with revisionist history. Okay. Let's see right here. So uh, Stonewall Jackson, if you read that article, it's, uh, it's from EssentialCivilWarCurriculum.com. And then this is a biography uh, written by James I. Robertson, Jr. about Stonewall Jackson, a uh, Christian soldier. That's the title of the article. Uh, his, a lot of the enemies feared him as well. Uh, during war because he was brutal. He was very strong in war. He had an Old Testament mindset. They say that during his life, he was loving, caring for people with his New Testament mindset on that one. But then in war, it was an Old Testament mindset. That's how he, that's how he did it. This man, was ba this man was truly the real deal with how he lived his life with God. Uh, he always uh, looked up to David and Joshua. He always looked up to David and Joshua and then uh, compared himself with that one. Uh, there's a movie called Gods and Generals, which mostly covers Stonewall Jackson, which I highly recommend. But one of his soldiers who asked him about his brilliant war tactics, he mentioned he would always quote scripture, look up Joshua chapter this verse and verse. Wow. But this man, uh, he was probably more spiritual than me. Whether you disagree with him about uh, his political views, his southern views, or his views about slaves, whether they should be slaves or free, the point is this, is that that guy was still more spiritual than me or probably a lot of you. Because this guy still prayed before uh, he did something. He prayed before he always did something. So that guy was very, very spiritual. Uh, if you know the rest of his story is that um, he got wounded 
uh, in battle because one of his men accidentally shot him in his left arm just below the shoulder and unfortunately he died. Robert E. Lee said of Jackson, he has lost his left arm but I have lost my right. So that was a famous quote by uh, Robert E. Lee concerning about Jackson. But there's a lot of things uh, to read about General Jackson uh, that is very, very uh, uh, moving actually. He mentions, uh, he gives some quotes right here. He mentions right here, God has been our shield and to his name be all the glory. Uh, he also, let's see right here. He, so, his men fondly called him Old Jack. Sometimes they called him Old Jack. He lived up to his name Stonewall because uh, truly he was like a stone wall that the soldiers couldn't override or the enemies can go over. Uh, one time the southern lines broke and drifted slowly up the hillside. General Barnard B. shouted to his faltering troops, Look, men, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. So the southerners during that time, they, when they were being heavily bombarded by the no northerners, Jackson motivated and stirred up the troops, being that stone wall, and then the men just stood behind him after that. Now, uh, look, I, uh, this preacher don't recommend Hollywood, but I would recommend Gods and Generals and uh, the Gettysburg, those two DVDs. You would, I would strongly recommend watching those things, okay? It's very moving. It's very moving about how godly uh, the people were during that time. Although you can say whatever mistakes they made about slavery or political views or getting involved in the war or whatever, uh, but if you overlook all of that one and ju just look at their spiritual lives, how they were very God-centered, you would very much admire them, very much admire them. Okay, so that explains the Great Awakening in the South. Civil War is done now, all right? Now we come to the fifth. All right. During the fifth Great Awakening, you get the famous D.L. Moody, and Charles Haddon Spurgeon taking it in England. So why is England able to have a heyday of revival? Uh, I've read some of the people to you, like uh, Billy Bray in the British Isles area. Why is it that they had a revival there? Because of the history of the King James Bible. It's still very rich there, so that's why there's some parts of revival, even though America would probably be a more spiritual place. But the Great Awakening revivals affecting America still affected England. But even more so when they had a different ruler, Queen Victoria. When Queen Victoria came to the scene, it was a rich time that the people uh, strived a lot on morality. So much so that liberal critics today, when they criticize uh, Vic uh, the Victorian lifestyle, they always criticize them concerning morals. Why do they pick on morality morals? Basically, they know this, is that Vict Queen Victoria's timeline, they, knew, they know this, they, uh, they focus so much on spirituality, on living clean for the Lord. And the liberals want to rub dirt against that one. So uh, did Vic Victorians have faults that time? Sure, but if I'm going to compare with Democrats and liberals today on their lifestyle, I would say, you know, look who's the hypocrite picking on which lifestyles to critique. You know, I find that very hypocritical. So whenever I hear their criticism on Victorians, I always say, yeah, but I'll compare them to the liberals. And I'll say, you're the bigger hypocrite every time that professor yaks his or her mouth. That's good advice for some of you who, who go to liberal schools. Whenever they criticize Christians and they're legit, compare that with them, the liberals, all right? And you'll be more disgusted with them, okay? That's great advice, okay? If you forget everything that I teach you today, remember that one, all right? Yeah, amen, amen. I better get an amen on that one, all right? I always go on a rant mode when I criticize the wickedness in this area. Okay, so continuing on page 140 in Dr. Upton's Church History book. Because this Great Awakening was so big during the Fifth Great Awakening, he said this, it had prospered so terribly under Queen Victoria that mid-Victorian morality 
and mid-Victorian ethics and mid-Victorian values became the greatest curse words in the vocabulary of the journalists and college professors since puritanical bigots and puritanical mentality and puritanical morality were used by the educated class as alibis for sinning. Amen and amen and amen. So that is the... So that is the fruit of the Victorians. It was so prosperous that uh, during that even now they criticize it. That's how much the Lord blessed it. It was so it, God blessed it so much that to this day the liberals would heavily criticize it. The devil will keep picking that timeline. Okay, so this is Frederick Widowson's uh, book, A Bible Believer's Guide to World History. Page 331. I'm going to, who is, who, just who is this Queen Victoria, right? Queen Victoria ruled England longer than any other monarch, ruling from just after her 18th birthday in 1837 until her death in 1901. She married her cousin Prince Albert Saxe Goburg in 1840 and gave birth to nine children. She remained a widow until her, until her death after he succumbed to typhoid in 1861. Under her reign, several important English diplomats and influential statesmen served, including William Gladstone, leader of the Liberals in the House of Commons and Prime Minister in 1868, and Benjamin Disraeli, the Tory conservative, who became her Prime Minister in 1868. Queen Victoria is said to have remarked that she wished Christ would return during her reign so she would have the honor of laying her crown at his feet. As a matter of fact, uh, this is not source, but you can look it up yourself. But there was a person who came from the regions of Africa and because the England Empire, remember that's the most successful time, Queen Victoria's time. Their colonization spread throughout worldwide. They were able to conquer more lands. Now remember, France, Spain, and England were the competitors. France and Spain had more territory than England. Yeah. But because of England's uh, people's history with the King James Bible, the Lord always blessed them. And, that's, and you saw the map earlier how they were outnumbered. Spanish territory all over here, French territory all over here, and <laughs> even perhaps this part was Spanish territory. This part was only English territory. They were surrounded. Then the French and Indian War changed everything. And then the American Revolutionary War really did the job. And the Great Awakenings just busted down the Catholic Empire, and they just spread throughout everywhere. Amen. So notice that this Baptist history is so significant even during politics. That Baptist distinctive about that independent mindset uh, based on the Bible, not independence based on hum humanism because you saw France's fruits, right? So, so I'm summing all this, this. This is so important. Okay, I want you to remember all this. That way you can understand how we ended up right here and then uh, how the Lord moves and everything. So remember all of that. Is so important. So England became, no doubt, incredibly blessed in its colonization. Now, again, you can say whatever criticisms, you know, about equal rights and, you know, British people mistreating, you know, the minorities and all that kind of stuff. But during those days, those minority nations also mistreated and were racist, too. Everybody was a racist during 1800 and 1900s. Stop picking on one group of people. You racist you, okay? Everybody was a racist. Get a life, okay? <laughs> All right. So, uh, bottom line is that there's no doubt that the Lord's blessing was upon that nation because of its uh, biblical principle. So because of its, her powerful empire, England's pro perhaps most prosperous empire and reign, one of the people in the regions of Africa came to visit Queen Victoria, wanted to know... He asked, what is the secret to England's greatness? You know what she took out? She took out a Westcott and Hort Greek text, a revised version, and said, no, that's when it fell apart. She took out a King James Bible and said, this is the key or the secret to England's greatness. You, and you don't think that God won't bless a country after that? God would bless anybody if they were to do that. Yeah. All right, so 
Diamonds, gold, and greed were the principal factors in the conflict between the Boers in South Africa and their British overlords. In 1880, a Boer Republic was declared and open conflict took place between them. This was called the Transvaal Revolt or the First Boer War. It ended with the Treaty of Pretoria in 1881. This was followed by a gun war with the Basuto tribe in 1880 to 1881 when they refused to give up their firearms. A Zulu civil war in 1883 to 1884 when restored king Setawayo, so I, I probably pronounced his, uh, mispronounced his name and a lot of other names wrong while I was reading. If I do that, just excuse that, okay? Uh, was overthrown by Zibelu, who was overthrown by Dinuzulu, son of Setawayo, the establishment of a German colony in southwest Africa in 1884. The discovery of gold in the Wit Waters stand in Zuzulan. In 1886, a Zulu rebellion. When the British annexed Zuzulan in 1887, the Matabeli Mashona Tribes War in 1893, which the British intervened in on the side of the Mashona, and finally a Matabeli uh, Matabeli uprising in 1896. So notice that there was a lot of conflict over gold, over the riches in Africa. Now remember that, because if the devil wants. Uh, <coughs> riches and gold, he's going to have to get that area. At the same time, uh, he's, what's his job? He's, his job is to always infiltrate, infiltrate, infiltrate God's movement. So if he wants the power, he's going to infiltrate England's empire. And if the Bible was the key where we get all the Great Awakening revivals, he's going to infiltrate the Bible. All right, keep all these things in mind, okay? All right, not really that important, right? Not really that important. So, but just keep these things in mind. Now we come to the fifth great awakening. Reading on over here, Dr. Upman says on page 142, <coughs> Charles Haddon Spurgeon, 1834 to 1892, was converted in a Methodist church on a night when only 15 people were in the audience. Makes you want to stay faithful in church, amen? You never know what, who might come out, all right? You never know who might come out. Think about it, church. What might happen to this church 10 years later? Yeah. Some of the people here. You never know, all right? You never know. All right, uh, anyways, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Famous Charles Haddon Spurgeon in England. He was known as what some people call the Prince of Preachers. Even to this day, Calvinists, uh, even Calvinists love Charles Haddon Spurgeon. That's how much of a great preacher he, uh, he was. Let's see right here. He began his ministry by distributing tracts and visiting the poor while working with the St. Andrew's Baptist Lay Preachers Association. Wow, how about that, right? Yeah, it's a good start, right? That sounds like a typical Bible believer, right? Uh, in 1854, he became pastor of a chapel in New Park Street, London, and later preached the remainder of his life in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, which seated about 6,000 people. George Lorimer says that Spurgeon's voice, voice was sweet, resonant, and tuneful, and of great caring quality, persuasive and sincere. Spurgeon despised the word reverend and crossed it off all of his proof sheets. Of his doctrine, Spurgeon said that he was a Calvinist and a Baptist. Vedder says that Spurgeon was a moderate Calvinist as to theology. He preached an atonement for the whole world and salvation through Christ's blood to everyone who will believe. Well, that don't sound Calvinist. Now, remember, see, if those Calvinists would start to lean more toward Baptist principles, you'll see God's blessing on them, right? Same thing with Whitfield, right? And Spurgeon. And Calvinists always uh, brag about those two guys when they don't realize that those two guys uh, are, more, uh, are more following the Baptist of that timeline compared to the typical Reform, Puritan, Calvinist crowd. Deadbeats that time, right? Let's keep reading right here. All right, Spurgeon established an orphanage, as George Mueller had done, a pastor's college, a co-portage association, and a book fund for distributing gospel literature. The AV was used in all of this literature, and until 1885, only the AV was used in his pulpit. 
Now, you might wonder why only up until that time? We'll see later on, okay? These guys ruined the Great Awakening revivals. They were starting it. That even Spurgeon messed up at near the end of his ministry, actually. All right, we'll come to that later. The influence of Spurgeon's sermons, which were printed, is almost immeasurable. Half of them, by count, come from texts in the Old Testament. Although a Calvinist, unlike John Calvin, Spurgeon was a premillennialist. Why, that's as dispensational as you can get. <laughs> An excellent idea of Spurgeon's methods in homiletics may be obtained from studying Otis Fuller C.H. Spurgeon's sermon notes, for, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Wilbur Chapman went to Spurgeon personally to obtain ministerial advice. Moody also was strongly influenced by him. So these two famous preachers were also influenced by Spurgeon very strongly. Spurgeon, who led thousands of Englishmen to Christ with the King James Bible, was responsible for one of the legendary church splits among the Baptists of England. Uh, the Baptist Union and the Evangelical Alliance both opposed him, and this friction gave rise to a dispute called the Downgrade Movement among the Baptists of England. R.E. Day says that the most significant, if tragic, figure is a heroic statue of Spurgeon standing in the narthex of the London building of the British Baptist Union. It was erected by the men who hated him and fought him, believe it or not. All right, let's see right here. The next person, page 144, uh, David Livingstone. As a matter of fact... Uh, out of his explorations, he was the one who gave Victoria Falls in honor to uh, Queen Victoria. He was a missionary to the people in Africa. Uh, his testimony also is amazing. Uh, when I took Baptist missions from Pastor Donovan's class, the heads up, though, is that he lived his life more as an explorer than as a missionary. So that was his fault. However, there is no doubt that he did some mission work and that he was... Uh, he had a burden for souls for, in Africa. Page 144, the intrepid David Livingstone moved up through Africa from Cape Town. He was the first white man to look at Victoria Falls and uh, he traveled 9,000 miles in 16 years, most of it by foot. And at the time of his death, he had traversed more than 28,000 miles. <coughs> he was alone in the jungles without his family for four and a half years at a time. Saw him for two weeks in a stretch of 13 years. As a matter of fact, um, you can look it up yourself, all right? This is not documented here. But David Livingstone, when he died, he died praying on his knees. So that's how his uh, beloved uh, f African friends, when they looked at his tent flap and tried to wake him up, they thought he was still praying, but he was dead praying on his knees. Uh, they were so moved by David Livingstone's testimony that obviously England wanted his body because of the exploration that he did under um, England's name. But then uh, what the African people did is that they carved out his heart, took David Livingstone's heart out of his body and shipped his body back to England to be buried. But they took his heart because they said his heart belongs to us in Africa. Yeah, wow. So that's why there's a famous song called Bury My Heart on the Mission Field, Lord. So you can look up that song, but that was taken after uh, David Livingstone. Another person uh, I would highly recommend reading this guy's life is C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd. Man, the Great Awakenings. We're still in the Great Awakening times. It's something. I'm amazed how much history there is here during the Philadelphia age. He worked in China in 1885 and in India and Africa from 1908 to 1910. While Westcott and Hort were at home, England, perverting the Bible by which Studd was saved and the Bible which he preached, and while Green and Schaff were perverting the same Bible in America, Studd took it with him and hollered, Nail the colors to the mast. Is there a wall in our path? By our God, we will leap over it. Are there lions and scorpions in our way? We will trample them under our feet. Soldiers of Jesus never surrender. Nail the colors to the mast. That's what he said about the Bible. He defended that book. He wasn't correcting it. All of the converts 
Stud, Moody, Finney, and Spurgeon and their students had been told that they were on their way to hell, that without Christ they were alone in the world. All of them were anti-Catholic. None of them believed in purgatory or limbo. All four men believed, as the Puritans, Moravian, Pietists, and Quakers believed, that the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom, and they didn't hesitate to let any unsaved sinner know that education without salvation was damnation. Godwin says that hellfire and damnation formed the prime mover in the many a so-called conversion under Wesley. Godwin told the truth. It was grace that taught their hearts to fear. Yeah. yeah. So even though historians and researchers criticize the Great Awakening revivals about fear, 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 no, that's a good thing. Amen. Amen. It was Dwight L. Moody who said, I do not know of anything that America needs more today than men and women on fire with the fire of heaven. The famous, here we go, D. L. Moody. Yeah, there's a movie about it too, and uh, it would be a good watch. It would be a good watch. There's a movie about it too. Charles Templeton, you remember that guy? Contemporary with Billy Graham and then fell away. He said, we do not need any more Dwight Moody's today. What we need are 20th century believers who will study the needs of 20th century people. Who does that sound like to you? Rick Warren. Who does that sound like to you, typical pastors of today? Yeah. Moody was converted to Christ in Boston by a certain Mr. Kimball of the Mount Vernon Congregational Sunday School. How about it? It was from Sunday, Sunday School. school. Wow. Makes you want to be faithful to your kids. Amen? Yes, sir. By 1857, Moody was holding street meetings. Oh, well, street preaching don't work. <laughs> in the roughest part of Chicago... They terminated in a small mission work with 13 street Arabs whose names were Red Eye, Madden the Butcher, Darby the Cobbler, Black Stovepipe, Rag Breaches Cadet, and so forth. There were a thousand members in this mission six years later. Because of his zeal for personal work and his steadfastness to small and insignificant tasks, because he wasn't a big guy, he did all these small things that pastors didn't want to get involved with. He was called Crazy Moody. That's why he was called that. Moody met Ira Sankey in 1870 and began to make the first real major use of solo singing in revival campaigns. So <coughs> Ira Sankey is huge. You'll see his name in some of our hymns as well. So Ira Sankey would sing and D.L. Moody would preach. The Lord mightily used this guy too. There's a lot of hymn writers that I want to uh, mention about, like the famous Fanny Crosby, Philip Bliss, and etc., but uh, Horatio Spafford, but I cannot get into them, all right? But I would recommend uh, reading, um, if you go to the Bible Baptist Bookstore website, then they have a book about hymns, uh, the, uh, about the hymns, all right? Just, I don't know the title, but just find that. There's always a story behind the hymns. So it's really good, all right? Anyway. Dr. Orson Parker, who held more than 400 series of meetings in his lifetime, said, I believe there is as much conviction lodged in the mind by singing as by preaching. End of quote. Oh, uh, Dr. Ruckman has the two uh, hymns right here. Okay. Oh, how about that? Historical Sketches of Hymns. That's one book title by Joseph Belcher. The other one is Stories of the Great Hymns of the Church by Silas Payne. If you, for, if you didn't write that, then you can write it down and ask me after church, right? Ministry of Moody and San Sankey is well known. They held meetings in Glasgow, Scotland, London, Boston, Baltimore, Cincinnati, Chicago, St. Louis, Philadelphia, and New York, and revival burned in their tracks. So this fifth came out because of Moody himself. He burned everything right there. And when Moody... The second time, 40,000 were waiting to hear him. He, rece he received his standard ration from the educated class whose refined sensibilities are always on edge about something. Always, did you notice the educated fools opposing the Great Awakenings? Uh -huh. You notice that every stinking time? They're the enemies. 
A pamphlet issued dur during his ministry had the following original observations to make about the work of the Holy Spirit in his meetings. Uh... One, man-made shocks. Two, spasmodic convulsions. Three, Plymouthism. Four, Arminianism, and so forth. Godwin obviously commented on that. And he said Moody was a religious fanatic. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Godwin. Yeah. All right. Sinners were converted listening to... Uh, I'm now on page 148. Sinners were converted listening to Sankey sing before Moody could preach a word. The inquiry room came into style. Charles R. Erdman says that Moody's delivery was peculiarly uh, natural and conversational. He seemed to be talking to the persons on the third or fourth row of seats. Though his voice was not rich or well modulated, yet it had such caring power that with no amplifier he could easily hold the attention of a crowd of 20,000 people. Moody was a premillennialist. Guilty dispensational, you. He said... Quote, some people say, I believe Christ will come on the other side of the millenn millennium. Where do they get it? I can't find it. The word of God nowhere tells me to watch and wait for the signs of the coming of the millennium, but for the coming of the Lord. End of quote. As Pastor Sluter said, that sounds like the imminent return of Jesus Christ's rapture. Not looking at signs, but his return. All right, then. Uh, while Moody was alive... The Catholic, Roman Catholic Revised Version of Westcott and Hort was published, and it was pushed and promoted. D.L. Moody never recommended it to anyone as a reliable translation. Concerning the liberalism and modernism that was already rampant in his day among the educated and ministerial, ministerial classes, See, that was, education messed everything up. Modernism, liberalism was coming to the scene. Moody said simply, quote, I want to say very emphatically that I have no sympathy with the doctrine of a universal brotherhood of man or a universal fatherhood of God. I don't believe a word of it. Bigotry. Bigot. Yeah. Concerning the monkey man, Charles Darwin, Moody said this, quote, what we need today is men who believe in the Bible from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet, who understand in the whole of it the things they understand and the things they don't understand. So he believed the Bible, not the evolution that was being taught that time. Educational works naturally followed Moody's ministry. Mount Hermon School for Young Men, 1881. Northfield Seminary for Women, 1879. And the Chicago Bible Institute. When Moody died, he cried, quote, No pain, no valley. If this is death, it's not bad at all. It's sweet. This is my coronation. It's glorious. What a guy, man. What a guy. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, Chicago Daily Sun... Uh, the revival was no doubt spreading so much in here that even the news media published this article, believe it or not. The center pile of smoke formed the outline of a large fat man with a beard. And the title of the cartoon said simply, Chicago needs another Dwight L. Moody. End of quote. How about that? As a matter of fact, he mentioned right here, when the World's Fair took place in Chicago in 1893, Moody rented the largest tent on the circus grounds and packed it out three times a day with twice the crowd the circus could draw. Wow. He assigned 40, 40 street corners in Chicago to young men in his schools, and they conducted daily street meetings there throughout the fair. Moody was a fanatic. All right, yeah. All right, I got more to read about this fifth grade awakening, all right? We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Now, what do you think those Catholics are doing? What do you think those elites are doing? Yeah, they're not done. The devil always, uh, the devil during the Philadelphia, he can't go public. He had to go private. William Grady's book, titled How Satan Turned America Against God, page 420. In 18, here we go, all right. In 1853, all right. Cambridge alumni, Drs. Brooke Westcott and Fenton Hort, 
began a covert, covert project to alter the Textus Receptus Greek text underlying the AV 1611 in over 5,000 particulars. As their private translation based on the corrupt Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts was nearing its completion. All right. Now, if you recall from our previous discipleship, uh, long, long time ago, when I talked about Alexandria, Egypt, don't forget Sinaiticus, okay? They dug that up, all right? They got it up. Was They began to lobby the Anglican hierarchy for a formal revision of the authorized version. Ah, remember the Anglican church, don't forget the history. The Lord was done with these guys, remember. So God was using more of the independent Baptists or people who had, who followed independent Baptist distinctives. Anglican church fell away to compromising with the Catholic church, remember? So don't forget the Catholics involved here. Now you might recall I kept the calling Anglican church not much different from the Catholic church. I still hold to that. But technically the difference is that Anglican church consisted of reformers. So there was a mixture of reformers and uh, Catholic, uh, uh, Catholic ideologies there. It's a mixture. But to me, I just call it Catholic, okay? So that's just my own opinion. No proof text, no documented proof. You know, it's an uneducated op opinion of mine, okay? <laughs> Unaware of the new Greek text, numerous scholars were drawn into the project on the pretext of merely assisting with co cosmetic improvements in the English. On the dates of February 10th and May 3rd and 5th, the Southern Convocation of the Church of England passed formal resolutions limiting revision activity to plain and clear errors. Okay, is that really true? Well, although several thousand Anglican divines affixed their signatures to a solemn protest, the pervert was allowed to remain on the committee. The pervert that Grady's talking about was Dr. Vance uh, Smith, pastor of St. Stephen's Gate of Unitarian Church. All right. How about that? With the Eucharist fiasco ended, the initial session was convened. After taking a solemn oath of silence regarding any and all forthcoming procedures and pronouncements, solemn oath of silence. Elites and Jesuits and these people always do that. That way they can get away with their sin. The 100 plus revisers were issued copies of the New Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament, Greek Testament. Dr. Benjamin G. Wilkinson writes, quote, when the English New Testament Committee met, it was immediately apparent what was going to happen. Though for 10 long years, the iron rule of silence kept the public ignorant of what was going on behind closed doors, end of quote. Most of the revisers, guess what? Resigned in disgust. How about that? Dean John William Bergen, the outstanding AV 1611 exponent within the Church of England confirmed, quote, the average attendance was not so many as 16. How about that? Does that smell, uh, smell like small elites to you? Running the show of everything? I smell a rat. For the record, Bergen was excluded from the project from the outset. Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Slime balls like Westcott, Hort, Ellicott, and Smith introduced one corrupted alteration uh, after another into the text. Even... Queen Victoria managed to get offended. Oh, wow. See, she even knew this was messed up. She even knew and she was smelling the empire would fall apart because of this mess that they made. Stanley Weintraub writing, quote, later in 1870, for example, when affairs in France and Prussia were dominating newspapers, conversations in the Queen's dispatch boxes, she seemed at least as concerned with the impropriety of the genealogical lines in the revised St. Matthew's Gospel, where the indirection of the words David begat Solomon of her of Uriah was clarified from authorized version to revise text to read David begat Solomon of the wife of Uriah, this, Victoria complained, suggested Solomon's illegitimacy. Although his parents David and Bathsheba had married after Bathsheba became a widow. That's what she complained, end of quote. Uh, Weintraub continues quoting, The queen, Colonel Ponsomby, wrote for her to Dean Stanley, is rather scandalized by the proposed alteration. 
This, I believe, he added, is nearly the only subject we have had much discourse on for the last three weeks except the war, which entirely absorbs our faculties. Wow. See, Queen Victoria, she knew which book. She knew that book. This is the secret, the key to England's greatness. Notice what happened. Uh, let's see right here. There's so much to read right here, but there's little time, so let me wrap things up here, okay? Queen Victoria was able to see the handwriting on the wall. In a letter to her daughter concerning the rise of Weishaupt's German socialism, don't forget Adam Weishaupt, she warned, quote, the socialist atheists are awful. Believe me, when there is no respect for God, no belief in future, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, no belief in the future, I guess, there can be no respect or loyalty to the highest in the land. Authority of some kind does come from above, and if that is trampled underfoot, and if the clergy, uh -huh. narrow-minded though they be, are ridiculed and abused, socialists, liberals, Everything will go down. Philosophy without religion will bring the nation down. Do remember that. End of quote. Isn't this interesting? Okay. What's interesting right here is that, remember Weintraub, he mentioned this was in 1870 when Queen Victoria was complaining. Also, Queen Victoria's complaint and warning about downfall, right? Of the nation, not just the Bible, right? Now, this was 1870. Check this out. Check this out. And I'll close it right here. This is from uh, Benjamin Porter. In The Lion's Share, A Short History of British Imperialism. Quote, from 1870 to 1970, the history of Britain was one of steady and almost unbroken decline economically, militarily, and politically rel relative to other nations from the peak of prosperity and power which her industrial revolution had achieved for her in the middle of the 19th century. Remember that one. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of Professor Quigley. If you know Quigley, in your mind, you're thinking Illuminati, Round Table, CFR, and Rockefellers, those guys involved. Because he wrote a book on that, and he was a very authoritative figure. So a lot of conspiracy theorists actually use his, his book. Because he exposed the Round Table. The Round Table, you got to know, is the birth to CFR. And all the big elite names you hear about, Bilderbergers, Trilateral Commission, etc. So, this is what Quigley concurs. The unification uh, of Germany in the decade before 1871 ended a balance of power in Europe which had existed for 250 or even 300 years. During this long period, covering almost 10 generations, Britain had been <laughs> relatively secure and of growing power. She had found this power challenged only by states of Western Europe, the Catholics, obviously. The unification of Germany by Bismarck destroyed this situation politically. While the rapid economic growth of that country after 1871 modified the situation economically. Now look at that, this economic thing, economic. William Grady argues from all this, do you happen to recall the year that England formally elected to get rid of her ancient spiritual foundation? Were these revision resolutions passed in 1870 by chance? How about that? Hmm. So the spiritual foundation was being neglected and then turning toward more prosperity. Do you, re do you recall that was a problem with every age in history? Oh. If you recall, even in America, pilgrims came in thinking about spiritual foundation. They were growing prosperous. What happened? They relied on prosperity. Yeah. Then the Lord used the King Philip's war and then uh, to kind of open their eyes a bit. And then, but then they, the Salem witch trials and the King Philip's war just made a fiasco. 
because of their concentration on prosperity, then the Lord sent the Great Awakening. That got them out of it. See, that got them out of it. So it's prosper. When you get, uh, listen up, church, this is important. When you become so spiritual and God blesses your life, that's when you backslide. Yes, sir. Never get too comfortable. Amen. You're going to forget your foundation. You know who took over during this economic prosperity? All right. You know what was also announced in 1870? Grady writes, in, in just another coincidence, 1870 was the year Pope Pio Nono, Pope Pius IX, proclaimed the doctrine of papal infallibility. Oh, wow. How about that? You know who came to the scene. Professor Quigley warned about 1871 was when British Empire was going to spread out. There's a guy who gave birth to the round table where Rothschild got involved and Jesuit mindset, just like Weishaupt, was involved. The secret elites are at it again. Illuminati, where they had a long time ago, was about to be reborn into a different name and a different person. Through the prosperity of 1871, uh, through the British Empire, his name is Cecil Rhodes. You get the Rhodes Scholar, and if you know about Rhodes Scholar, you hear about Clinton and all that kind of stuff. All right. Next time in the history class, Amen. we'll see what's going on, how the devil tries to attack in, uh, he tries to attack Christianity again through secret elites again. They come out again. And this time, they really last this time. Illuminati uh, was disbanded. They had to fl flee in secret back to Masonic lodges and so many other gazillion secret club organizations. But now it's been revived again. It's been revived again through Cecil Rhodes. Guess what tactics he follows like Weishaupt, Jesuit. It's strange. They always admire Jesuits. Yeah. That Catholic minds, that Catholic conspiracy never left, never left. And then we're going to continue on the Great Awakening Revivals. Lord keeps moving in. Samuel Porter Jones. Mm, nice. All right, we're going to see how the Lord continues moving back to back. Father God, I pray that tonight's history lesson has been a blessing to the hearers. And uh, we've opened our eyes more to mankind, humanity, where they're heading toward. May we truly... Uh, learn from history. May we learn from history so that we don't repeat its mistakes, Heavenly Father. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.